Uh, welcome everyone to day two of PyConza Day 2017. Um, our first speaker this morning is Helge Reikeros from Norway, and he will be speaking to us about data science in Python. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is doing great this morning, and that you're all coffeeed up and, and good to go. The title of the talk is Sen and the Art of Data Science. So that's, that title is actually referring to two things. The first is I'm going to show you quite a bit of work that we've been doing at a company called Offersen, which happened to be sponsoring this co conference also. And it's also a reference to a book by Robert Piercig called Sen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And I think one of the main takeaways of that book is that tools matter. And in Python, we have quite a set of really nice tools for doing data science. Just so that you know a bit about more, more about what to expect. So I'm first going to talk a bit about what is data science and what does a data scientist do. I'm going to talk a bit about where does Python fit into data science and what tools and techniques do we have available. Then I'm going to do some interactive demos. And finally, I hope we can have a nice Q&A session. This talk is really for pe people that might want to do their own data science projects. And I want to give you an idea where, where you can start and what are the tool tools you can use and show you kind of the whole entire data science pipeline from getting the raw data to using the output of your predictions or recommendations or whatever the result of your data science is in a product. Right. So what is data science? Data science started, it's about, the field is about 10 years old. It started somewhere around either on LinkedIn or Facebook. And these companies had a need f for a term to describe people that typically knew more about software development than a typical mathematician or statistician, but also more about mathematics and statistics than a typical developer. And these, uh, you can imagine these companies like Facebook and LinkedIn, they had a need to do things like, they, they changed um, before you really had data science you kind of had pe database people, so people who would be concerned with how to get stored data and get data back. And then you had people working on business intelligence, which would do ad hoc um, analysis and do reporting and dashboarding and those type of things. So with data science, we started using the data in the products themselves. So you can imagine at LinkedIn or Facebook, they needed to give you recommendations for who are the people you might want to connect with, or they needed to decide what is the content that we need to show this person that's going to be more re most relevant to this person. So that is really what data science is about. And um, Python has been quite popular tool and language in, in, this, in this field. This is just from, from Google Trends. The sort of main competitor is R, although I know people who use a lot of both. But we can see that Python is is, is quite popular. Uh, if you look at a sort of subfield of data science called machine learning, you can see is, is Python is, is very, very extensively used there. Um, all right. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about machine learning. Machine learning is kind of the, the data scientist's power tools, if you will. Uh, it's typically the thing we throw out a lot of problems, and um, I'm going to do this as a, as a bit of an interactive demo. So just to, just to describe the problem a little bit, maybe you need to know what, what Office and Office and does. So Office and takes the traditional recruiting model, specifically for software developers, and, and turns that around. So instead of you going to a company, applying for a job, you put your profile on 
of a sender. It might look uh, something like this. I'm going to show you quite a bit of data, but don't worry that your profile is going to pop up here because it, this is all running against the office and test environment. So it's all, it's all made of data. Um, but yeah, you can say something about yourself, which roles you're interested in, which skills you have, what you want to do next, and so forth. And then companies will apply to you. So they will say, okay, this is what we can offer you. We like your profile. Do you maybe want to speak to us? And the data science problem there is to match, obviously, companies with the right candidates. So the basis of that is uh, matching on skills. If a company is using Python, you want typically to recommend Python developers. If they're looking for more experienced people, you want to recommend experienced people. If you're looking for junior people, you want to uh, recommend those. And um, So how would one, one go about doing something like that? Okay. <coughs> so this is the Jupyter Notebook. It used to be called the IPython Notebook, but these days you can do a lot more in it. Uh, you can do R and you can also do Julia. So it supports actually multiple languages, so that's why they changed it to, to be called the Jupyter Notebook. Who here has used the, the Jupyter Notebook? Okay. A lot of people. That's, that's really cool. Um, this is really like the data scientists' uh, lab, lab equipment, lab notebook, everything into one. So you, you write your, your code, Python code, in these cells, and then you can execute those cells, and you can get the output. So it will render the output. It will render things like tables, it will render visualizations, and so on. So let's, let's think about this problem that we're dealing with. So let's say we have a couple of skills, like for the sake of the argument, there's four skills. Uh, Ruby, Rails, Python, Django. Uh, now you want to take a, uh, say a candidate on the platform, and you want to encode what this person does. So say this is a Ruby on Rails developer, then you would encode that as one one zero zero in an array. Okay. Um, and then you might have another company also at the platform and they are looking for Ruby on Rails developers. So then you would also encode them as one one zero zero. Um, and then you can execute that. In machine learning we often use uh, we don't use, uh, okay, so we want to say something about how similar are these two. We often don't use the, the normal Euclidean distance, like the distance from uh, New York to London, or Cape Town to Johannesburg, those are Euclidean distance. We normally use something called the cosine distance. Cosine distance just measures instead of the absolute uh, distance, it just measures the angle between, between, between two vectors. And that is a better way to describe the idea of similarity. So the cosine of zero is a zero degree angle is one, so that means two 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 vectors are, are absolutely parallel. And the cosine of a ninety degree angle is zero. That means the two vectors have not basically independent, they have nothing to do with each other. So in between there you can say something about similarity. Um, so if you do the cosine similarity of these two, you get one, which means it's a perfect match. Right? Um, then let's think of another company that, that don't use uh, Ruby and Rails, but say rather Python and Django. You would then encode that as 0, zero 1, 1. And you would take the cosine distance there again, and you would get the answer zero, meaning these have nothing to do, do with each other. There's a couple of issues with this approach. So let's say you had a candidate that said, okay, I'm a Ruby developer, so I would encode that person as one, zero, zero, zero. And you had a company that says, now we use the Rails stack, for instance, so you would count 
encoded as zero one zero zero. If you would take the cosine similarity for, for those two, you would get the answer zero, meaning they have nothing to do with each other. But that's not really really the case. We know that these things have something to do with each other. It's just that they're not they don't use the same word. So machine learning doesn't deal very well with uh, it, it likes arrays and, and vectorized data. It doesn't deal deal very well with like text and so on. So we need to find a way to turn uh, text into this kind of representation. So what we really want is more something uh, where a term like cat and kitten, which are related, would also have quite a large large similarity. And um, this is a problem that, that people in the sort of NLP, natural language processing part of machine learning, has been doing a lot of work on and studied. And a kind of state-of-the-art way to solve this problem is called word embeddings. I'll, um, so what a word embedding does. So <coughs> you can imagine if you would represent every word in English alphabet in, in the way that we did up here, you would need a vector as with as many entries as the English alphabet, which would be thousands. And it would also be a very sparse and inefficient representation of it, because most of the, most of the times, most of the entries would be zero. So what word to x says is, okay, let's find a, it's called a word embedding. It's a lower dimensional uh, structure. Normally a word in, in word to x will have like maybe 100 dimensions, or far fewer than the words in the English language. But it's, it's, it's got to cram all the words in the English language into this 100 dimensional vector. So that's the property, f the first property of this, uh, this word to vec model. Second is it must be predictive of its context. So the word cat uh, needs to be predictive of like a word like per. Uh, and you could have other words like dog, which is similar to cat in some sense, but wouldn't be predictive of per. It could be predictive of jump or animal because they're both animals. So that would typically be the context, context uh, that you'd be looking at. And people have trained this model. Uh, I'm using one here called the Glove. Um, this is a pre-trained model. So that it's actually people at Stanford that have downloaded the entire Wikipedia. And they have trained this model on like a, a cluster of, of computers for days and then they but they make the, the, um, the results available, so, so we can obviously use it. Um, and, and this model has some nice properties. Let's just have a look at uh, any word like developer, or maybe let's do cat. Uh, so this is the vector representation for the word cat, right? So that looks very different from <laughs> Uh, what we were doing previously up here with ones and zeros. It looks it's like a bunch of ra random numbers, but they're not really random. You can do things like, what are the most similar uh, words, for instance? And then you get things like dog and rabbit and monkey and other. So it seems to, and, and, and it did this just by reading Wik Wikipedia and looking at what context do cats appear and in what context do dog, uh, dogs appear and it's figured out that hey these things have something to do with each other so that's pretty cool what you can also do you can give it a negative word so you can have essentially this reads as king plus woman minus man so if you have king and woman but not man what you get queen let's see um, This is oh something snuck in there. fat fingers okay so the top the top one is actually uh, queen so you can see this is what makes 
sort of the artificial intelligence people quite excited because it looks like this thing has actually learned something about the real world in that it can can do things like that. It can also, if you give it a, a, a list of words, it can figure out which one is least similar to the other ones. Right. So if you have breakfast, cereal, dinner and lunch, uh, which one would you say is, is the odd one out? Cereal. Let's, let's see if it gets that. Uh, so it got that, right? So that's pretty interesting. So I did this with, with the OfficeSense data. OfficeSense has a lot of free text data. Not as much, obviously, as Wikipedia, but, but quite a bit. So I all the companies uh, say something about themselves, the culture, what stack they use, uh, how old they are, are they a startup, are they a corporate, all these type of things, and what perks you can expect. And similarly, the candidates are asked to say something about themselves. And how do I keep my skills sharp? And also, what, what do I want to do next? And um, so, so we put this, this data through this model, same thing. Um, okay, that is not, not there. Just gonna quickly fix that. <coughs> I'm going to have to skip that part because then I, uh, <laughs> I seem to have lost that model. But yeah, we did a very similar thing with, with the things and we found uh, if you put in things like uh, Rails and Django, it, it gave you uh, like, like frameworks, uh, web frameworks. If you put in uh, the odd one out there, if you have Python, Ruby, PHP, and MySQL, which one would be the odd one out? Uh, MySQL. So, so it actually it actually got that. Cool. <coughs> So then we have kind of a good back to representation of what is a company and um, what is a developer. What we want to do at this point is, is to build like a classifier. So, so what a classifier does is as this good example, so there's good recommendations. So we have, historically we know that these companies have liked these type of developers. Uh, these are the blue, sort of the blue dots. And then we also have things that are not a match. These are, these are the, um, the red dots. And, and machine learning is kind of trying to find a, a straight line between these two. Uh, where the one um, at, at sort of best, best separates the two classes. Good recommendations and bad recommendations. So that's the one property of this thing. And the other one is that the further you are from uh, from this line, you can see the more certain you can be about it being a good, a good recommendation. So this is essentially what we do, except we don't really use, no, normally yeah, we, we never work in two dimensions. The machine learning problems are often very high dimensional, thousands of dimensions, and we also don't really use straight lines. But the idea is the same. And um, to make this thing work even better, 
we we also go and we ha have access to uh, like domain experts in the field of recruiting. There are a lot of experience in matching candidates with companies. So we ask them to to label a lot of this data, and, and but the problem is you can have you have hundreds of companies and thousands of of developers on the platform. That's millions of combinations. So which one do you choose to label? And there we can use an idea from information theory that says that where you will get the most information is where um, you have the highest uncertainty. So that might sound a bit funny at first, but if I ask you, say, every year if you're going to PyCon, and every year you say, yes, you go to PyCon every year, then I might as well not ask you, because there's no information in that, because you're going anyway. Right? Um, but if you, on the other hand, flip a coin to decide whether or not you're going to PyCon, then the answer you're giving me is going to be quite, quite informative. So we want to, 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 to label the sort of points that lie close to this line, where there's the highest amount of uncertainty if it's a good recommendation or not a good recommendation. So that's the machine learning part of things. And that's normally what, what is thought in courses, and there's a lot of information available on that part. There's a lot of other things that it, it takes to, to get a, a, a data science project successfully working in, in production. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, one very nice project, which I did really recommend you check out, is a cookie cutter project data science cookie cutter project. I think it's, it's one of the best uh, cookie cutter projects. It's very well documented. Uh, it's like people have really thought about what is the best way to structure a, a data science project. Um, and uh, they've come up with, with this thing. They explain why they why they done it the way they've done it. So the way they do it is put up, you have so you have your data in the structure, so your raw data, that's where you, that's the data you would just dump from your, your database. Uh, and then you often do some sort of aggregation on that, so you would calculate means of things and variation of things and so on, and you would join different tables and you would clean up the data and filter it. You must put it in the interim and then finally processed. Uh, uh, directories and it's got uh, a separate directory for models and then another one for notebooks and reports and your source is kind of where your your actual code sits and it's structured in a similar way so so so, so this is this is the actual data the output of the the the, the process your source is uh, structured in a similar way, so you have your data, you can, uh, with a couple of scripts that it takes to, to produce a data set, uh, features that you would use for, your, use for your machine learning models, for training and predicting and visualizing. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, Another really useful project is this one called Luigi. It is developed by Spotify. And um, what Luigi does is kind of manage your whole data pipeline. So, so you define each step in your data pi pipeline as, uh, as one of these tasks. It's just an example of a Hello World task. But each task has certain requirements. So this task will require these two tasks to be run before it can run. And then it, it, it represents its own state by its, its output. So, so it, it's quite simple in that sense that it, it checks, is my output produced, so is my output data there? If it's not, then I need to run. Then it checks, okay, is my dependencies run? If they are run, I can run, otherwise they need to run first. And that kind of, that's kind of the whole, the whole thing. And you can build incredibly complex data pipelines 
with Luigi. And then at the end of the day, you want to make your results available somehow. And, well, I guess there's different ways to do that, but one that I prefer is using his Flask. Flask is a sort of very lightweight web framework. This is, this is Hello World, so this will create a web app that returns Hello World if, if, if you got it. Uh, so it's, it's quite, because it's so lightweight, it's quite suitable for creating APIs. So that's often how the end of the, the data science pip pipeline looks like. If you want to make recommendations or predictions, you expose that as an API, and then other people in the company can then work against your API to use it in, in, di in the different ways in, within the product. Uh, so let me just demo the API that we have. Okay, so so this is called Yente, which is the matchmaker in the Fiddler on the Roof, and it uh, is how we expose the recommendations for com companies, for candidates to companies. So so if you are building the the front end of the of this product. You'll you'll give it uh, like UIDs for the company and UIDs for the company member. You say how many how many do I want? This is the um, Swagger docs. It's something you can install in, on top of on top of Flask uh, quite easily. And um, it gives you the documentations for the API, but it also it also allows you to test it out interactively, which is quite useful if you're working against it. So that's okay. So, so now I, I ran the API and I got my recommendations. Now OfferSend is, 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 is um, they say they're using a Ruby on Rails stack, and that's kind of the. The environment, and I, I mean, on my profile, I, I said that I'm a Ruby developer and I like running and craft beer. Uh, none of which are true, but. Uh, so, so, so it decided to recommend me to to offer send on the test system, obviously, uh, as l along with a few others. So that's that's how the API works. So that's the whole pipeline from the raw data uh, in the operational database to, to, to creating uh, something that can be used internally in the company. Right, so I hope that was, uh, yeah, give you a useful, if you're looking to do your own data science projects. It, it will be a good starting point. A couple of, couple of nice tools that you can use. Also, you can go and check out OfferSend. Uh, as of this week, they, we are allowing data scientists on the platform, software testers, uh, and also designers. So and, uh, I think there's a lot of demand for data scientists out there. So do check that out. And um, yeah, we can. I guess we can do a Q&A and a bit discussion. It would be interesting to hear what, uh, if you're already a data scientist, how your your process works, and, and you can compare notes on that. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Helga. Um, we have 10 minutes for questions and answers. Could I get a volunteer to run around with the microphone? I need a volunteer, help a volunteer to run around. Someone who is being pointed at. Is that a volunteer for the microphone or is that a question? Ah, someone is coming. Okay, put up your hand if you have a question. This person here. Hi. 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 Uh, for most data science projects, my understanding is that you need quite a large corpus of data. Uh, is 
how big is the corpus of companies looking for developers and developers on the market? Because my understanding is that the number of developers on the market is quite small. It is in the thousands, so it's quite a decent amount of data, actually. Uh, I thought you needed something on the order of like hundreds of thousands or millions or something like that for this. No, no, no. You, don't. you can, you can, you can do this stuff with, with, with a few thousand points also. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, interesting. Um, on Luigi, have you also looked at Airflow, and do you have any opinions on one versus the other, and why you went with Luigi? No, I have not looked at. Yeah, flow, so I can't really answer that question. But yeah. uh, when you use the word to vec uh, models, uh, do you take into account any kind of inherent uh, biases that co comes from the, the, the corpus that's been trained on? You know, like uh, racism or sexism or something. In the in the word to vec models like that, mm. it's it's quite a active area of research in machine learning at the moment. Uh, and how do you how do you prevent algorithms from being discriminative in any way? Uh, because they will just use whatever is in the data. Uh, we haven't well, I haven't looked at any specific things things on this particular project, but it's, it's obviously something uh, yeah. keep in mind. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I, I, I want to know, like, how often do you guys retrain your models, and what is your infrastructure for uh, model retraining? And, like, what kind of safeties do you have, like, from, for instance, introducing a bug and rechanging, like, Having rogue uh, weights on on your model. And How often we we re retrain it? Yeah. yeah. And what's your the retrain infrastructure? So uh, what's your, the tech stack of your retrain infrastructure? Uh, we train it probably like daily. Um, and uh, the stack is basically what what we showed there. So so the training is also Luigi tasks. So yeah will start with you do a, a fresh dump of, of the data and then you drain it through all the aggregations and processing parts of the pipeline. Uh, then, um, then it will feature engineering part and then it, you will do the training which we generate a new model. Uh, you check some metrics that it's, 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 it's My question you can, you can is test it on historical data that it would have performed pretty well to check that it's, it, it's is working. This, um, does it require human intervention, or it's an automated process? At the moment, it is still manual. Yeah, but it's something one could obviously automate. Yeah. Um, sorry, how did you get started? So, w before your company is launched, and you don't have any candidates and any um, companies. Did you have an existing database from an, a traditional recruitment company, or what did you use as your initial training set? I mean, I, I just um, recently actually joined to, to work on this project, and yeah. Uh, Not sure. <laughs> so so it, it's, um, it's, it's a common problem, yeah, if you have a cold start problem, if you don't have any data, you can't, you can't. So typically, machine learning, you would use it when you have enough data for it to make sense to, to start using it. Yeah. Hi. Um, great talk, thanks. Um, are you using successful placements and unsuccessful, like when someone has reached out to with an interview request and they decline it, do you work that data back in as well? That is the training data for the, the classifiers. That's how we, we, we find the the good recommendations, those are historically the ones that would have resulted in an accepted interview, and the negative ones will be the ones that, that didn't that didn't do that. No. Okay, thanks. In terms of your model set itself and annotation 
of the data that you have? How much work does it take to actually do any annotation, work through the raw data set? Do you get to you take advantage of the OfferZen interface itself to function in that direction for you? What kind of challenge does that pose? Um, yeah, we do, we do build a, a feedback loop into the actual, actual product itself, uh, where the people who are using it can say, okay, this was a good recommendation, so this was not a... Does that answer you? <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. <coughs> so this is a philosophical question, really. Um, you had a, f uh, s a classifier up there. Um, the question is really, like, at what point does traditional statistics become machine learning? Because, I mean, that classifier you could represent as maybe a, a, a nearest neighbor algorithm. Is that, is that uh, machine learning? Or, I mean, is there a traditional kind of point at which, or a definition of machine learning that differs from sort of standard statistical analysis? No, I, I think, um, yeah. Machine learning, you, you can define it as, as you have, instead of explicitly programming the machine to do what you want it to do, saying if this, if that, you rather give it just examples of what it needs to do, and then it will learn to do that. So there's a lot of statistics in there, but I think maybe the, the objectives of the two fields are different, although the methods are often the same, logistic regression, it's machine learning model, uh, a nearest neighbor would be a machine learning model. So, yeah. Hi. Uh, there? Uh, there. Um, do you work just in English with that training or do you work in different languages as well? We just work in the data that what we have access to is, is just um, it's English, it's yes, just but, English. but the model itself is language agnostic. It will, you can give it gibberish and it will try to find patterns in it. Uh, well, I, I'd imagine you get some complications with the collutive languages, you know, languages that uh, tend to build on words rather than separate words out. English is a rather tokenized language. So, so with this, this word to work model, you really just give it a corpora of, of oh, text and it, it will, it, it's trained on what, 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 what is the typical context around different things. So, yeah, you don't assume anything about uh, how the language is, is structured in it. Uh, yeah. And uh, does it handle a full set of Unicode? It does because we may made it <laughs> made it do that. But it is always often a, a pitfall. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the issues are Unicode related. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone? Um, thank you very much again to Helga. Okay. Thanks.